Vermont College and Graduate School in July of this past year. And he's had, uh, no doubt, a challenging year like anyone working in higher education at this time. Um, he came to Vermont from Widener University Delaware Law School, where he had been a dean and professor since 2015. Previous positions include serving as president of Furman, Furman University, dean at Washington and Lee University, and the University of Richmond's law schools. He's been a faculty member at Washington and Lee, no, excuse me, William and Mary, DePaul, the University of Illinois, University of Arkansas Law School, and a visiting professor at Duke University, George Washington University, Indiana, Denver University, University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, he's admitted to the bar in Illinois, Virginia, and Delaware. And he has presented oral arguments in state and federal courts throughout the country, including at the Supreme Court of the United States. Author of more than 100 published articles and a number of books, um, he's a acclaimed scholar with a focus on constitutional law, civil rights, freedom of speech, and mass media, particularly in matters pertaining to libel and privacy. So with this illustrious education, it seems important to note that he's, in his family, a first-generation college student, and he has received his law degree from Duke and his bachelor from Yale. So let us welcome Rod Smuller. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim, and thank you all for coming. Uh, some of you know that uh, the brilliant model for social media is a thing called um, UGC. This is the acronym for what makes Facebook and Twitter and so on so successful. Does anybody have any notion as to what UGC might be? Well, it's what media lawyers and business people called user generated content. And if you think about it, it's such a brilliant scam. So Facebook makes billions of dollars from everything everybody else contributes and says. <laughs> so I, there's no copyright in an idea, and so I've stolen this idea. I get invited all the time to give talks, and I've, uh, sometimes I'll be presented with a nice bottle of wine for doing it, or a dinner or something. And, but I've decided that what I will do is steal the Facebook model. And so what I engage in is a UGL. Can you guess what that might be? You're on the right track. You pray, that's good enough. User-generated lecture. So you thought you were coming and we get to sit here and maybe daydream and talk about, think about other things, but you've shown up and done, been nice about it. But what I'm going to do is force you into an interactive series of role-playing exercises. And I know we have a lot of friends that are watching online, and we'll figure out a way to bring you in from time to time. There'll be pauses in which you'll be able to do it. Rather than follow the Oprah Winfrey model in which if you talk, we're going to have somebody rush to your side with a microphone, you'll see that this is going to require a lot of spontaneity. And so you can just you can just react and talk spontaneously, and I'll sort of, in, in responding to you, incorporate what you said or repeat the question so people that are watching remotely will be able to figure it out. Now, over the course of this uh, evening, I'm going to take on many, many, many different personas and roles, and you're going to take on a number of different personas and roles. And what I have found over the years is that this works better if I use some magic in doing this, if I cast spells on you from time to time to get you into the mood to be these other people I'm going to have you be. And of course, I'll need to cast a spell on myself to be in these moods. And I have also found that if I take a little tincture of this substance that I have, and some of you maybe afterwards can ask me what it is, it helps me get into the psychic mood I need to be into and helps me cast the appropriate spell on you. So if you just give me a second to just take a little... <laughs> Transformicus seminarius. 
I am the leader of a prominent American divinity school, and I am happy to cast a spell on all of you and have you enter the theology course that we have at this seminary, at this School of Divinity. And so welcome, students. It's a delight to have you here. I'm now the professor of this course, which is a course we've been investigating for the last several months. It is a course on comparative religion and theology. And we have been exploring many different religious traditions and also exploring the intersection of various religious practices and traditions and psychology. So one of the books we just finished reading was a famous book by William James, Varieties of Religious Experience. And so over the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at an issue that I want us to spend five minutes on right now. And here is the issue. As we've seen across many different religious traditions in the world, there often is a sacred or fundamental text that is the sort of anchoring of that particular religious tradition. And what we've seen is that almost invariably, within a particular religious tradition, there tends to be a spectrum of approaches to the meaning and the authority of the text. And we've, it is truly a spectrum, but we've seen at each end, in religion after religion after religion, the same, the same phenomenon. There tend to be folks who view the basic text of the religion as literal, as inerrant, as never evolving, as having a fixed meaning that is there for eternity. And there also tend to be, within the same religious traditions, people who approach the text in a very different way, who see it as, as evolving, who see it as subject to interpretation, who see it as, although remaining sacred in their tradition, nevertheless not to be taken literally, not to always be believed literally, and to even have meanings seem to clearly evolve over time. For example, I happen to go to a church in Vermont, and on the Easter service, the pastor talked about the difference between believing everything and not believing everything in the Bible, and, uh, and not wanting to belong to a church in which you're forced to believe everything the church says. That's one example, but there are others. So here's my question to you as seminarians. And I think we only have time for one comment on each side. Can you explain to me, from all we've studied, how you perceive the mindset or the belief structure or the psychology of those that find it important to believe the text is fixed in time and its meaning never evolves? And then conversely, how would you explain the, the thinking, the feeling, the understanding of those who seem to be comfortable with their own fundamental text, their own sacred text, seeming to change its meaning or its lessons over time? So students, where you're being graded, the floor is open. Anyone want to volunteer for either of the two insights? Gus? Well, if, uh, if the received textual wisdom isn't what it says and doesn't mean what it says, then anything, you can believe anything. And one person's interpretation of updating it or modernizing it could differ radically from another. So we're groundless and rudderless if we can't stick to the literal interpretation of the language. And so one observation is that the text can't be a unifying set of principles or beliefs or truth unless it has some primacy, unless it has some authority, unless it has some in inerrancy. And if you're free to just decide what you want to believe in and what you don't want to believe in, and, and you can just go a la carte, then 
than where a wash in relativism. And does it matter, just as a follow-up, does it matter if you believe the text itself is somehow divinely inspired? I mean, it has the, literally the authority of, of God? Or? Yes. Absolutely. That, that's got to reinforce that view. So how then do you explain people who will say, I grew up, and when I grew up, I was taught this as the meaning of a scriptural passage. <laughs> and now I've come to see it a very different way and believe it has a different truth. Do we have a volunteer for that? Yeah? Well, I think it comes right back to how language changes and the fact that these are all translations and um, language itself doesn't remain fixed with one meaning. It changes over time. And um, so how can you possibly, how can you possibly have okay. a fixed understanding of something? So one, so, so one interpretation is that it's just inherent in the way we use words and the way the language evolves and language can mean things to g generations present that were, are different from what they meant in the past, particularly when one adds the complication of a text starting in one language being translated into many others because translations are subjective. Any other thoughts real quickly on how you explain? Yeah, yes? Those religious documents are historical. They happened way back at a certain time in history that they were first developed. And, hi and history has changed. As a woman, I feel that very strongly. Mm -hmm. So just the idea that it doesn't seem right to be bound by things from 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago or whatever in a literal sense, and the notion that generations should be somewhat free to think through their own interpretations of things. Well, you've graduated from divinity school. Congratulations. I'm now going to take on a new role. I'm going to take on the role of the head of a law and graduate school. I, let's just make me the head of the Vermont Law and Graduate School. And you have all applied to admission to the law and graduate school program. Some of you want to be lawyers. Some of you want to take other degrees. Some of you have actually gone to divinity school first, and now you have to, you've got that degree, you want to become a lawyer. I'm delighted to admit you all. Welcome, welcome to Vermont, welcome to the law school, and welcome now to my guest, a professor who's going to lead you in a class in jurisprudence. Hello students, good to see you again. I am your professor in the jurisprudence course. The jurisprudence course is a, an exploration of legal philosophy. So it is to law what theology is to religion. And we have spent the last several weeks studying a number of famous legal philosophers, as various as Thomas Aquinas and Oliver Wendell Holmes. And in the last couple of weeks, we have noticed that almost all legal philosophers and almost all legal systems, and particularly the American legal system, struggle with the question. And the question is, how should lawyers and judges approach the meaning of a fundamental text? And so when we have studied this in this course, we have treated as fundamental texts, for example, the United States Constitution, but also as fundamental texts certain pieces of legislation, certain transformative legislative enactments that have had a dramatic impact on society. A prominent example would be the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And what we have seen is that there's a spectrum of views among lawyers and judges about how to approach a text. But we've seen two extremes. And on one hand, there are people who believe that the meaning of a text, a constitutional provision, like equal protection of the laws, is fixed in time. It should be understood literally. It should be understood in the way that those who wrote it understood it. And it should be applied in a way consistent with how they would have applied it at the time. And so if you want to know what due process of law means, if you want to know what the equal protection of the law means, or freedom of speech, you have to go and find out what the folks in 1789 or 1791 thought it meant, or in the case of things like the 13th, 14th, or 15th Amendments, 
what the, what the world, what the Civil War generation and post-Civil War generation thought it meant. And that should be binding on us today. And then we have seen other jurists and other lawyers argue that it is possible for the meaning and interpretation and application of a legal text to change in time. Now, I'm interested in how you would explain the psychology of those that are the, we'll call them the originalists, and how many of the, how you would explain the psychology of those willing to accept the notion that meaning can evolve. And um, I know we have some divinity school students in the class as well. So to the extent you think it's like or unlike religious traditions that are posed with the same conundrum, you're invited to comment. So does anybody want to comment, again, on either of the two perspectives? Well, as a student of Divinity School, um, I become bothered by this Peter, like St. Peter, who was saying that slaves supposed to obey masters, and thinking like how Christ was teaching to love, um, you, even your enemies and like thinking the masters they actually didn't love the slave in the first place and so I do not really okay so one 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 problem you've identified is the text may strike us today as simply immoral and untenable there is slavery discussed in the Bible and of course slavery was part of the original constitutional design in the American Constitution. So it may just, you may just feel you must somehow come up with a device. Now I suppose an opponent could say, yeah, there's a way to do that. You change the text, you amend the Constitution, or you change the laws. Um, but that's certainly one of the problems that a current generation may simply find unacceptable, uh, intolerable, the meaning that we know a prior group ascribed to it. Um, would, would you, let me just ask the law school class here, would you agree that in many ways the thought patterns are essentially the same. That some of the same things that make you feel you shouldn't have a license to change the Constitution if, for example, you're a Supreme Court Justice, just because a current generation feels differently than a past generation, some of the same things. If how is the text to have authority if it doesn't, if it's if it's not somehow binding on folks? Um, there may be an additional problem that in a, de in a democracy, um, you want people to vote on things and, and not just have judges make the decision. Um, but I suppose there's a parallel in, in that there may be differences in the way language evolves or perceptions about the meaning of phrases evolves that a, su a subsequent generation will want to bring to bear. Well, you've all graduated from law school. I will now, I may need to take another quick nip here because the next role I have to play is pretty profound. I am now the President of the United States, and there is a vacancy, in fact there are multiple vacancies, for the position of Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. And I'm going to exercise my constitutional authority and nominate all of you to be Supreme Court Justices. Now you may be thinking, I thought there could only be nine at a time, something like that. But remember, we're under mystical spells, okay? Transformicus Supreme Corticus. We're under mystical spells. E pluribus unum. You know, out of many can come one. So we can have an infinite number of Supreme Court justices tonight. And so I'm now going to play the role of the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and it's my duty to do background checks on all of you. <laughs> oh, bet I scared you. Don't worry, it's okay. You've all passed the background checks. Uh, I'll now be. Uh, the entire United States Senate, all 100 at once. This, we're in church, these things are possible, right? So all, 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 all 100 at once. So I am, I am Bernie Sanders and I am Mitch McConnell. I am, you know, uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren. I, I, I'm all the whole shooting match. And I unanimously confirm you to be justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. That doesn't happen much in our society, but your, your acumen and probably your degrees from the Vermont Law and Graduate School made this a rare example of, of bipartisan unanimity. You've all been confirmed. So I told you there might be some physical elements to tonight's interaction, and this is the first one. So if you are able, 
I need you to please stand and raise your right hands, please. I will be the Chief Justice of the United States. Those of you online should do the same, but of course we can't catch you if you're, if you're being dishonest. And would you repeat after me, please? I do, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. I will do equal justice to the rich and the poor and will, to the best of my abilities, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States for roughly the next 45 minutes. <laughs> Congratulations, Your Honors. You may be seated. I will now uh, hold a festive celebration. It's not every day that a graduate of the Vermont Law uh, and Graduate School becomes a U.S. Supreme Court Justice, let alone so many at once. So I am, I am the president of the school holding a reception for you. I know you're about to put on your robes and go into your first day of court hearings. Um, but let me remind you a bit about what you learned when you were in the um, law school. You're going to hear oral argument in three cases, and there's going to be some time travel. Each case will be about 10 minutes long, five minutes on each side. There'll be some time travel. One of the cases you'll hear has been argued and decided by the Supreme Court. One of the cases that you'll hear has uh, not yet been accepted by the Supreme Court. And one of the cases that you'll hear has been argued, but not yet decided. So there'll be some time play here as we go through the, as we go through the exercise. In actual life, a lawyer before the Supreme Court is by tradition given the courtesy of 15 or 20 seconds before the first questions are asked. So the justices always let you get your name out and identify who you represent, and then by tradition, immediately the justices begin to ask questions. So those of you in the courtroom, you can just shout your question out. You can say Mr. Smola or counselor and ask your question on any issue of facts or law that you think are germane to the matter. And one advocate that you'll hear from will go back and forth with the court for five or six minutes, and then the second advocate will be, do that. We'll repeat it for these arguments, and then, if you know the play uh, Alexander Hamilton, there's the song The Room Where It Happens. We'll be in the room where it happens, and you, the justices, can decide the outcome of the three cases. So I will let you know, as the president of the school, I will let you know the outcome of the first case, because it's actually been decided. You may or may not know what it is. I want you to erase it from that, that from your minds right now. So I will now be the United States Marshal in charge of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oye, 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 the Chief Justice, the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. All persons having business before the court are admonished to draw nigh and lend their attention, for the court is now in session. God save the United States and this honorable court. Mr. Smalley, you may proceed. Thank you, Chief Justice. May it please the court. I'm Rodney Smola. I represent the employers in this case, Bostock versus Clayton County. Your Honors, my clients are all employers, one from Georgia, one from New York, one from the Midwest, and each of them fired an employee because of either the employee's sexual orientation or the employee's gender identity. In two of the cases, the one from Georgia and the one from New York, the employer, after discovering that an employee was gay, fired the employee. In the third case involving a funeral home, a funeral director who worked for the Harris Funeral Home, my client, had hired a person that the company, the funeral home, understood to be a male, indeed a person who was assigned um, the sex of being a male at birth, but who then transitioned from male to female, took a new name, Amy, 
and presented herself as a female. And the employer found this unacceptable and Amy was fired. In all three cases, the fired workers and the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, claimed that the employer, my clients, had violated the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That act contains a sentence that prohibits discrimination in employment on the basis of sex. And the plaintiffs took the position that that is what happened here. That position was legally untenable because for 40 years, American courts had consistently held that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 does not prohibit sexual orientation discrimination and certainly does not prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender identity, such as one's status as a transgender person. Yet in these cases, the plaintiffs and the government have made the claim that that long-standing interpretation is wrong. And I stand before the court not arguing the merits or demerits of whether society should or should not prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual identity or, or uh, sexual orientation. But rather, I stand in front of you saying, only Congress can change the meaning of a federal statute. And it is a legal certainty that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was never intended to prohibit these forms of discrimination. How do we know that? Well, first, in 1964, in most American states, to even engage in homosexual conduct was a felony. It is unthinkable that those who passed this law thought they were protecting people that they regarded as criminal. Secondly, for those who were advocates before the lexicon LGBTQ came into, into parlance and people were talking about advancing gay rights or lesbian rights, one of the great victories for those advocates came in 1972 when Wisconsin was touted as the first American state to ban employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. That would make no sense if the Congress had already done it in 1964. And third, 40 times since 1964, up until the last few weeks, senators and members of Congress have introduced bills in the United States Congress to add sexual orientation or gender identity as a prohibited form of discrimination. They've all failed. Well, that has a lot of meaning. First of all, Congress would not do it today, apparently. They won't pass the bills. But more importantly, why would these folks be introducing these things if the law had already made that kind of discrimination illegal? And finally, Your Honors, I've never been in front of the court and been allowed to talk so long uninterrupted. But finally, <laughs> let me just suggest to you that law is meaningless and lacks integrity unless language has meaning and language has integrity. And we use different phrases to describe identity. I look at the members of the court, I look at anyone in society, and in my mind, different words will come into my mind to describe different kinds of identity. I might say, oh, there is a man, oh, there is a woman, oh, there is a person of color. I might know more about the person. Oh, that person is Jewish, this person is Muslim, this person is Christian. I might know about sexual attractiveness. This person is gay, this person is lesbian, this person is bisexual. I might know that a person has transitioned from one to the other. This person is a transgender person. Those are all different forms of identity. A single person may have many different forms of identity. They may have a racial identity, a religious identity, a gender identity, but they're different things. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964 picked some of those things. It banned discrimination on the basis of race. It banned discrimination on the basis of religion. It banned discrimination on the basis of sex, but not sexual orientation. That's a different thing. 
And if you respect our democratic system, if you respect the notion that a law has got to have some integrity to it, or it becomes completely meaningless, unless you think you somehow are empowered yourselves to change a law of Congress, it doesn't matter whether you like what my clients did or not. You cannot hold them responsible for violating a law that doesn't prohibit what they have done. I see my time has expired. If there are members of the court that have questions for me, either in the courtroom or I know some of the justices are appearing. I think Clarence Thomas may be appearing remotely today. I'm not sure. But if any of you have questions, either online, if you have them online, you can transmit them via chat to the court reporter. Well, Your Honor, I think the first four points that I've talked about illustrate what we know the members of Congress could have been thinking. Prejudice against gay persons was ubiquitous in 1964. It may still be very, very widespread, but it was ubiquitous in 1964. The notion that those members of Congress, the notion that President Lyndon Johnson, who signed the bill, were thinking about protecting gay people or lesbian people, let alone transgender folks who they probably didn't even, maybe even understood existed, it, it's, it's nonsensical. And sex was used in its common sense meaning. The, the, the hearings of those that, that, that enacted the legislation, they were thinking about men and women. And they were thinking women have glass ceilings, they get discriminated against. It's not just people of color that we have to protect. Women are second-class citizens, too. They need this protection, and that's why Congress passed the law. And that's what everybody thought. Yes, Your Honor. I'm persuaded by your description of the state of mind of those legislators and most people. But can we say that their intent was to eliminate discrimination, and we now have a broader understanding of discrimination, and there are parallel forms to those narrow definitions they apply that we can see of the counterparts. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I understand your question, and, and will the court, uh, my time has expired, the red light is on the podium, will the court give me the time to answer the question? Yes. Your Honors, we think that that theory that you have articulated, which is that what those who passed the law wanted to do was to attack discrimination. And what we've now come to understand is that discrimination has many more polymath forms than we may have thought it had back at the time, would be a free-floating license to have this court substitute for a law that's very specific. You can't discriminate on this basis. You can't discriminate on that basis any form of discrimination it found distasteful or onerous. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 did not at the time deal with discrimination on the basis of disability. It took a new law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, to handle that. It didn't, it didn't handle discrimination on the basis of age. It took a new law, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, to do that. And we know that the democratic process is capable of working Many states have amended their civil rights laws to include gender identity or include sexual orientation as a prohibition. Many universities, many employers, many of our, I mean, there are churches that are considering whether this is important. But you have to let that process go. You can't sit as a bunch of philosopher kings or queens in the Supreme Court of the United States and make decisions for the polity. I, I see that my time has expired, Your Honor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We, we have a question. Oh, <coughs> Your Honor, I, there's a question from one of the remote justices. Yes. <clears throat> uh, Glenn Wiley asks, to the extent that medical understanding of gender has changed since 1964, should not the law recognize that change? And, and I think the answer to the justice is the same as, as that which I gave. What we should be bound by is what those who wrote the law understood it to mean. Otherwise, the concept of law is meaningless. So yes, among many segments of society, 
People may have new insights into the meaning of concepts such as gender. You may read the book Becoming Nicole and discover things you never knew before about the way gender may evolve and the, and the, and the mysteries around gender identity. But that doesn't mean that a court is free to import those different perceptions and impose them on the country at large. Th thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Small, you may proceed. <clears throat> Chief Justice, may it please the court, I'm Rodney Allen Paul Smola on behalf of the three employees here who were treated, as my friend representing the employers has already admitted, in a way contrary to other employees, entirely because of their sexual orientation, and in one case, the employee's gender identity. Let me first attack the central premise of the petitioner's argument. The premise that somehow the meaning of words in a fundamental legal text are fixed in time. It's our position, Your Honor, that you do not look simply at the conception, but you must look at the concept. The conception is the mental state of those who passed the law, what they were thinking, what their universe of imagination may have permitted, what they, could, what they thought they were doing. But it's possible that they enacted a principle, a concept, that they weren't capable of seeing at the time, but that now another generation is able to see with greater insight than they had. That is not a betrayal of the text. That is allowing the evolution of the meaning of a text as human sensibilities themselves evolve. In the words of the hymn, I once was blind and now can see. And this is not unusual in American life. The Constitution of the United States is our most fundamental text, yet we constantly read into that text not only new meanings to phrases, but we read into the text phrases that are not even there. We have read into the text that the, this court has the power to overturn laws that are contrary to the Constitution. That's not even in the text. We have read into the text that the President of the United States can assert executive privilege over certain confidences. That's not in the text. This court has said there's a right to privacy. There is no right to privacy in the text. But more fundamentally, this court's realized again and again that even the words that are in the text take on different emanations and meanings over time. Let's take the most important, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Those who passed that famous law saying that no state shall violate the equal protection of the laws, those states that passed that law and, the, and those members of Congress did not believe that that meant that white people and black people should be able to go to the same schools. This court held in Plessy versus Ferguson that they were just fine with the notion that there could be apartheid, there could be forced legal segregation of whites and blacks because the law never intended social equality or civil interaction. The law merely required that the treatment be equal even if it required separation. That was Plessy. As to sexuality, those who passed the 14th Amendment were utterly blind to the possibility that it could apply to discrimination based on sex in the most traditional sense. We know shortly after the Civil War, shortly after the passage of the 14th Amendment, a woman sought admission to the Illinois bar Myra Bradwell, and she was regarded as the most highly qualified, knowledgeable person of, about law in the state of Illinois. This is before there were law schools in the way that we know law schools for the most part. Abraham Lincoln, Illinois lawyer, read for the law, and so had Myra Bradwell. <clears throat> Illinois had an absolute prohibition on women practicing law. And she took her case to this court, and this court said, there is no right whatsoever for a woman to practice law. <clears throat> the ordinance of women is to be mothers and creators and, and, that, and, 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 and wives. It wasn't until the crusading of lawyers like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, later a member of this court, 
that finally the court came to see that yes, equal protection of the laws included the concept of sex discrimination. And most importantly, in the Obergefell case, Obergefell versus Hodges, the landmark case in which the court said there's a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. You interpreted the Equal Protection Clause and you interpreted the Due Process Clause in a way that would have been utterly beyond the imagination of those that passed those amendments. <coughs> in Justice Kennedy's opinion for the court, had that key sentence in which he said, the nature of injustice is such that we often don't perceive it in our own times. And so I'm going to leave you with this, Your Honors. <clears throat> Would it do violence to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to say it prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or transgender status? No. In the words, some of you may know there was once a movie called Rocky. More often you may know Rocky VI or Rocky Seventeen. but in Rocky there's this moment when Sylvester Stallone says, it's simple mathematics, you hang around with dodos, you're going to be a dodo, all right? <laughs> this is simple mathematics. All sexual orientation discrimination is automatically sex discrimination. And all discrimination on the basis of transgender status is automatically discrimination on the basis of sex. Let me give you the simple, logical demonstration. Imagine, if you will, two employees working for an employer, like one of the employers at issue in this case. And one of those employees had the, the gender assigned at, at birth as a woman and identifies as a woman and appears to be a woman. We'll call her Mary. And the other had an identity at birth assigned as male, presents himself as a male, and is a male. Is, it, thinks of himself as a male. So we have Mary and we'll call the other employee John. Mary and John. Both have lifelong partners. Could be their marital partners, does it matter? They have lifelong amorous partners with whom they live. Mary is married to a partner we'll call Peter, another person who identifies as male. John is married to a partner we'll call Peter, another person identified as male. Mary keeps her job, John loses his job, right? The employer says, John, you're gay, you lose your job. Mary, you're not, you don't lose your job. They're both married to Peter. What's the only variable? John's gender and Mary's gender. That's the variable. One employee was on the job, the other employee was not on the job. It's the sex of the employee that determined whether they were hired or fired. All sexual orientation discrimination logically is sex discrimination. Now you may say, okay, I get that, but now we're, how, how, what about transgender status? This is now, how do I, how, do, how, does, how is that gonna come into play here? It's the same thing. Imagine two employees, both of whom present themselves as women. Both are directors at a funeral home. Both appear, they, 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 have, they have hairstyles, they have clothing styles, they present themselves, they have names that we commonly associate as names of women. They present themselves as women. One was identified as a woman biologically at birth, the other as a man biologically at birth. One keeps the job, one does not keep the job. It was the gender identity at birth that was the distinction. All transgender status is, by definition, discrimination on the basis of sex. Thank you, Your Honors. Any questions from the court? Well, I'll now take on the role of president of the Vermont Law and Graduate School, and you're back in law school for a moment. You've done a good job in your first oral argument. And let me tell you this, the court decided the case. It's an actual true case decided in the year 2020. It is in fact called Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia. And the three examples I gave you were the actual examples. 
By a six to three vote, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that those forms of discrimination are prohibited by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The four liberal justices at the time were joined by Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Neil Gorsuch, who wrote the opinion of the court. And he adopted the views of the second advocate across the board in holding that it doesn't matter what those who passed the Civil Rights Act were thinking, it matters what was the concept that they enacted. We'll now hear oral argument in two more quick cases. The second case that you're going to hear argument on is a case that involves what lawyers would call a circuit split. You may know that the United States is, well, of course you know this, you're Supreme Court justices. The United States is divided into a number of regional federal appeals courts. In the aftermath of the Bostock case decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, battles over gender identity over the status of transgender persons were fought in many arenas, but the two arenas that emerged as the most prominent areas of contest were first whether or not public entities, and these were almost always school boards and public schools, could prohibit a transgender student from using the bathroom that aligned with his or her current gender identity with their current gender identity, or whether they could be told they must use the bathroom of the sex that they were assigned at birth. And then somewhat parallel were litigation fights over athletics and over the extent to which a person could compete in athletics if the person was transgender, if the person was competing in the women's league or the men's league that was not parallel to the identity with which they were assigned at birth. You're about to hear oral argument in a case involving a division between the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eleventh Circuit. They have reached opposite conclusions in the last few months. The Fourth Circuit is the circuit that encompasses the Mid-Atlantic. South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, and Maryland. It held that school boards that force the child to go into the bathroom of that child's biological identity at birth violate the Equal Protection Clause, violate the Constitution. So a very progressive liberal ruling from the Fourth Circuit on the side of transgender rights. The Eleventh Circuit, just a couple of months ago, reached the opposite conclusion. The judge in the case is widely rumored to be the number one person on the list for confirmation if President Trump were reelected as president. Um, and so you have now the Supreme Court in front of you about to hear oral argument. Because the court's running behind time, you'll only hear three or four minutes for advocate, but don't be afraid to ask questions. Mr. Small, you may approach. Thank you, Your Honor. Chief Justice, may it please the court. My name is Rodney Smola. I represent the school boards. Your Honors, the 14th Amendment didn't uproot American society and change everything we know. Of course it is the case that if a school board were to assign students to bathrooms on the basis of race, it would be an open and shut violation of the Constitution. Sadly, that was once true in American life. Sadly, there were many places where there were toilets assigned to people of color and toilets assigned to white people. And for a long time, this court allowed that under Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. But it came to understand that this stigmatized those who were being separated and that there was absolutely no valid governmental reason for keeping black people and white people from using the same bathrooms. But your honors, my clients aren't segregating on the basis of race. They're segregating on the basis of gender, in bathrooms, in athletic programs. And there's a giant difference. 
And there's a giant difference between what my clients are doing and something like employment discrimination, which was what was at issue in this court's ruling in Bostock. And what's the difference? Fundamental notions of human nature about privacy and biology and modesty that have been part of human nature time out of mind. Historically, in this culture and most cultures in the world, men and women who are strangers do not appear naked in front of each other. They don't engage in bodily functions in front of each other. They don't shower together as part of our societal traditions. And the government has a right to respect that societal organization and say there are men's bathrooms and there are women's bathrooms. And the men can't use the women's bathroom and the women can't use the men's bathroom. And there's men's basketball and there's women's basketball. And because of the biological differences between men and women, differences in strength, differences in endurance, differences in size, there is a perfectly logical, non-evil, sensible, we say compelling reason to follow these norms. And the 14th Amendment didn't uproot them. My goodness, there have been men and women's bathrooms since the Civil War <laughs> until, until uh, most places today. And the idea that somehow the 14th Amendment or the Civil Rights Act of 1964 were meant to entirely uproot those traditions and prevent the simple notion that people do not want to be in these relatively private, intimate, modesty situations with people of another gender is a perfectly appropriate policy choice and legislative choice. And we urge this court not to strike it down. If the court has questions, I see my time has expired. Mr. Smalley, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, my, my friend for the petitioners has woefully understated the stigma and the harm here. You heard Mr. Smoller refer to Plessy versus Ferguson. Well, I will refer to it too. One of the most evil elements of this court's decision in Plessy was the lie the lie in which the court said, to the extent that those of the colored race, that was the phrase the court used, to the extent they think this is a badge of inferiority stamped upon them, there is nothing in the actions of the government to indicate that's what, what Louisiana or the city of New Orleans had in mind. It's because of their own subjective interpretation of it. It's because they choose to place that construction on it. And thank goodness, finally, after the century of horror and the century of evil that that decision visited on this nation, a decision that was exported to other countries like South Africa, finally in Brown versus the Board of Education, the court finally spoke the truth and realized that separate is inherently unequal and that this decision to separate black and white children or people in bathrooms based on race was inherently stigmatizing. It was intended as a badge of inferiority. Well, that is every bit as true for my clients as it is for persons who were subject to the Jim Crow laws. My client deeply and sincerely and authentically believes in the gender identity they currently have adopted. And there is nothing in the record to dispute that. Their individual stories verify that. That's true of my client from Maryland and my client from Georgia. And the science supports it. And the medical profession supports it. And it is humiliating and degrading and stigmatizing and wounding to not allow my client to use the bathroom associated with his or her gender identity, with their gender identity. And there's no disputing that in this record. And your honors, be honest. What's the big deal? 
What's the big deal? Most of the bathroom stalls are individual stalls. To the extent that the state in Georgia is arguing, oh, we have men's bathrooms with common urinals, or in athletic programs, we often all shower together. The Constitution's answer to that is, you can't let the remodeling costs stand in the way of the violation of equal protection and human dignity. If you've got to install individual stalls, go ahead. If you want to have individual showers, go ahead. You can go to athletic clubs all over this country. You can go to universities all over which country. They've done that. As between the modest expense of providing for that, if you think that modesty is so critical, and the, the humiliation and the violation of the rights of these students, the answer should be clear. The Fourth Circuit got it right. The Fourth Circuit understood that this is exactly what this court held in Bostock, that this form of discrimination is inherently in tension with the Equal Protection Clause, and you must have profound justifications for it, and they don't exist here. Does the court have any more questions? Well, thank you, Your Honors. You have one more case to hear. Will this one will be even faster? Uh, I'll, be the, or I'll be the law clerk and tell you the fact pattern. The state of Colorado is one of the enlightened states in the United States that does prohibit discrimination openly in the Colorado Civil Rights Act on the basis of characteristics such as sexual orientation or gender identity. A web designer, a web page designer named Lori Smith, left her prominent corporation to go into business herself as a web page designer. She was inspired to do this because she designed the web pages for her own wedding and thought, I'm really enjoying doing this. I think I'll try to make this a private business. A same-sex couple approached her this is, the, this is the hypothetical, basically. The state of Colorado, that's really a better way to say it, said, uh, good, you have a license, you can be a web page designer, you're in business. She said, oh, but I will not perform, I will not engage in web design activities for a same-sex couple, for a same-sex marriage, because as a matter of religious belief, I am conscientiously opposed to same-sex marriage. I refuse to let my services, my expression, be used to celebrate something that I believe is against the command of God. The state of Colorado said, in that case, you violate our civil rights laws and we can put you out of business. The Supreme Court of the United States has heard oral argument on the case. You will now reenact the argument very quickly. Mr. Smalley, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Your Honor, my client is a deeply devout person. She happens to believe that God has ordained that marriage must be between a man and a woman, and that two men cannot be married in the eyes of God and two women cannot be married in the eyes of God. She doesn't refuse to provide design services to gay persons or to lesbians, or to bisexual persons, or to transgender persons. She, she will design almost anything you want, no matter what your identity is. She complies with Colorado's civil rights law in that respect. But the one thing she won't do is use her creative talents to write text and to engage in graphic designs that celebrate something she regards as sinful. Why should she have that right? It's our position this court has again and again said it violates the Constitution to force a citizen to profess something that they do not believe. One of the most important cases ever decided by this court was West Virginia Board versus Barnett, in which a Jehovah's Witness child refused to stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of a school day. Because the Jehovah's Witness child believed 
that to pledge that allegiance was contrary to the command of God. And in a famous decision, this court said, the state of West Virginia cannot make her do that. You can't make her say it if she doesn't want to say it. And one of the most famous sentences ever written by this court, Justice Jackson said, if there's any fixed star in our Constitution, it's that no official, high or petty, may prescribe what is orthodox in matters of religion or politics or opinion. But that's what Colorado was doing to my client. Later, that principle was reinforced in a case involving the license plates of the state of New Hampshire, which say on the plate, live free or die. A pacifist in New Hampshire did not want to drive around with the words live free or die on his car, and he taped them over. And a New Hampshire state trooper pulled him over, because it turns out that's illegal. You can't mutilate a license plate in the state of New Hampshire. And this court ruled in favor of the car owner and the driver saying he didn't tape over the numbers on the plate. He didn't tape over the word New Hampshire. He taped over an ideological message with which he disagreed. And he has a constitutional right not to be forced to say that. He was just having to drive with a license plate. He didn't have to literally say anything, but even that, she said, was unconstitutional. And finally, we rely on the St. Patrick's Day parade case, the Hurley case. Hurley versus gay, lesbian, and bisexual group of the city of Boston. St. Patrick's Day parades and all parades in the United States tend to be run in one of two ways. Sometimes the city runs the parade. The city will run the 4th of July parade or the Martin Luther King Day parade or the St. Patrick's Day parade. In my hometown in Chicago, the city ran the parade. The mayor dyed the river green and everybody was pretty much celebrating St. Patrick's by about 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> but in many places in the country, the parade is run by a private entity that gets a license or a permit or a franchise to run the parade that day. A church or a civil rights group might get the franchise to run the Martin Luther King Day Parade in Philadelphia. Or a church group might get the franchise to run the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Boston. And that's what happened in the Hurley case. And the organizers of the parade, a private religious group that were given the right to run the parade, refused to let a gay and lesbian and bisexual group of Irish citizens march in the parade. And the state of Massachusetts, just like the state of Colorado, said, you're violating the civil rights of these people. And you ruled in favor of the church group. You ruled in favor of the discriminators saying, when you run a parade, you get to decide who's in the parade. And if you're forced to have people in the parade that you don't want to associate with, it violates your free speech rights. It would be like forcing a civil rights group to, make, to allow the Ku Klux Klan to march in a Martin Luther King Day parade. Of course you wouldn't do that. Well, that's what's going on here. There are lots of web page designers. This same-sex couple has their pick of hundreds in, in Colorado that will do the service. My client doesn't want to do it, and the law should not force her to do it. Thank you, Your Honors. If the court has no questions. Mr. Smolley, may proceed. Chief Justice, may it please the court. I'm Rodney Allen Paul Smola, the Attorney General of the State of Colorado. Your Honors, I think this is a case of been there, done that. You've already decided this. You've already decided this multiple times. The argument that you've just heard is candidly indistinguishable from the argument that was originally advanced when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. In two 1964 cases, Katzenbach versus McClung and Heart of Atlanta Motel versus the United States, you had before you challenges to the Civil Rights Act. In the Katzenbach case, a barbecue joint in Alabama, in Birmingham, Ollie's Barbecue, did not want to serve barbecue to black people. In the Heart of Atlanta case, a motel in Atlanta didn't want to allow black people to use the motel. And you upheld the Civil Rights Act. And in the Heart of Atlanta case, you flat out said, 
the operation of civil rights laws that force businesses to serve people on an equal basis does not infringe on any constitutional liberty. Years later, the same argument that we've just heard was put forth by the Rotary Club and the JCs. Rotary Clubs in the United States historically did not allow women members. You could go as a guest of a male member, but if you were a female doctor or real estate agent or lawyer or, or pharmacist, and you wanted to go to the Rotary Club because you enjoyed the music and the food, <laughs> You had to go as the guest of a male. You couldn't be a member. And the JCs had a similar rule. In both instances, enlightened states prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex and brought those rules to bear against the Rotary Club and the JCs. And they claimed a First Amendment right to discriminate because they didn't, have, didn't want to be forced to endorse ideas that they didn't believe in. And you rejected that. There are lots of Coloradans who day in and day out buy things, get served by people, do all sorts of activities in which the person serving them, the person selling them the thing, the person performing the service may have identities and belief structures and viewpoints very different from the customers. It's Colorado's position, if you enter the commercial marketplace, you got to serve all comers. You can't pick and choose. And you can't pick or choose based on identity. You can't pick or choose based on ideology. You can't pick or choose based on, based on in this case, the same sex status. I'll end by saying this. In the Oldridge Fell case, in the final passages of that opinion, this court talked about the sacredness and the centrality of marriage in human nature. And the court said, and these couples don't denigrate marriage, they celebrate it. And the Constitution should give them that right and should extend to them the human dignity that they deserve. And it should extend to them the equal protection of the laws. And that's what Colorado has done. And you ought not bring that same Constitution to bear to damage the human dignity of this couple. My friend acts as if this is a one-off, one lonely little web designer, Lori Smith, who chooses to discriminate. But your honors, there are waiting in the wings armies of people that will put out no same-sex persons welcome here for this service, no same-sex persons welcome, welcome here for that service. You would be allowing that prejudice to drive a truck through the decision that you made in Overtsville. And I urge the court not to. Thank you, Your Honors. All right. Transformicus Supreme Corticus, Hamiltus, room where it happens. Is. So you know what happened in Bostock. In Bostock, the court ruled six to three in favor of the notion that these laws should not be brought to bear, or uh, should be brought to bear against this form of discrimination. Let's now convene as the court and invite anybody online that wants to offer a comment. And you can offer them either way. How would you decide either of those second two cases? And then maybe we can ask ourselves how we think the actual real Supreme Court will decide either of the two cases. So the floor is open for the justices. It would be unethical for me to be in the room at this point, but I'm going to cheat tonight. <laughs> Any thoughts from anybody? Yeah. I just have an observation. It's interesting to me when you address <clears throat> before the court, the court as though it were continuous. That's just fascinating to me. I wonder if there are other institutions <laughs> are in our society that consider themselves immutable in that way. Yeah, that's a fascinating point. For those of you online, this is just a stylistic point. You heard me say over and over again, this court said that and that court said that, even though the court that I would argue in front of today would be very different from the court that I argued in front of 20 years ago in front of the court because it changes. It is, um, so first of all, it may just be style. It's a traditional style, but I do think it has a deeper meaning. I don't know if anybody else listening or uh, here thinks. I think it's actually a tribute to
to the rule of law, to the notion that in theory there is some, there is some continuity and some overriding set of principle and legitimacy that transcends the individuals who happen to be on the court. That may be a lost notion because we've become so polarized and we think of the liberals on the court and the conservatives on the court and we have such battles over confirmation hearings and we see events like the Dobbs case where we know that the substitution of one justice for another changed the result. But you can still appeal to it. Well, it's, you can appeal to it. So when I teach constitutional law to students, I tell them perhaps naively, perhaps they snicker and they bite their cheeks as they listen to this. I say this is not called constitutional power, it's called constitutional law. There, there should be some integrity to reason, to evidence, to tradition, to, to precedent and so on. Doesn't mean the law doesn't change, but there should be some adherence to principle. So that's an interesting thing you picked that up. Other, other observations, questions? You can be in the role of justices or you can cast off the spell and be yourself, whatever you prefer. <laughs> Right. Well, they often say, you know, my right to swing my arm ends where your nose begins. Mm -hmm. And um, there is, you know, somebody, a web designer might have a, a right to feel a certain way, but when it's doing a bigger harm to society, then that, that right has to be curtailed. Mm -hmm. That right is lesser than... And, 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 yeah, than so for the... Mm -hmm. So for the benefit, the benefit of the people online, the, the observation is the kind of traditional notion associated with people like John Stuart Mill and others that you may have a lot of liberty, but the liberty ends when you injure other people. I think the thing that makes the designer case hard and that made its predecessor case hard, the predecessor case, you will remember, got a lot of publicity a few years ago, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case involving the same issue but instead of a web designer, it was a custom cake designer outside of Denver. And in that case, the Supreme Court avoided the tough issue you just argued, heard argued, because there was proof that Colorado officials were prejudiced against religion and had, had religious animus behind their decision to come down against the cake shop owner. And that tainted their actions. Whereas in this web design case, there's no evidence of that. So you really have the issue posed. And what I think makes it a hard case, um, I'm, I'm not giving you my views on it, just having it makes it a hard case, is that both sides here claim there's harm. So to, to the religious adherent, to Lori Smith, she says, making me do this is making me actually say something I don't want to say. And one of the hints we got in the cake shop case, written by Justice Kennedy, who's now gone, who was probably the, the most instrumental justice as a champion of the modern Supreme Court for the progression of rights based on sexual orientation. He was the author of the Obergefell case. One of the things he said in the cake shop case was something like this. This is a paraphrase, but for routine commercial activities, the idea that you would have a kind of get out of jail free card to discriminate would clearly be rejected. If you're going to enter into businesses, you can't discriminate and the government has the right to prohibit all forms of all sorts of discrimination. So if you were supplying the chairs for the wedding, of course, you couldn't discriminate. If you were supplying the lighting, if you were supplying the food, let's say, all right, you're just, you, you have no more right to, to do that than you have the right to refuse to sell someone a pizza from your restaurant on, on, on these bases. But once it's not just a hamburger, <laughs> once it's, you're actually having to express yourself in some way, that's the fascinating question. Does it change? And in the cake shop case, it was, there was a threshold issue, well, is making the cake even expression, or is he just baking food, you know? And he made the point it was artistic and so on. The web design case is no question. She's being forced to say certain things. Um, <clears throat> I, I did this exercise with our law students about a week ago, and we got deeply into, you know, is she just 
a passive worker like a print shop. You know, the print shop would have to print, would have to print the pamphlets, there's no question. Um, is she just providing the web page in some way? She's the, you know, she, or is she affirmatively having to engage in expression of a sort that we should say credits these other activities? What, no, please. No, when, when you're finished. Well, what, one, one other quick thought. Along those lines, you can, you can say, when, when the expression is commercialized, we lose our sympathy for you. <laughs> And, and what, if you're going to enter the stream of commerce, check your prejudices at the door. So I don't think we would say that, one's, that, that a cleric could be perfor forced by a civil rights law to perform a marriage contrary to the cleric's religion. We would, of course, say that the free exercise of religion clause or the free speech clause or both prevent you from making a minister or a rabbi or an inman or anyone from engaging in a ceremony that has sacred significance to you contrary to your religious beliefs. That would undoubtedly violate the, the Constitution. Classic example that's often given. You couldn't use anti-discrimination laws to force the Catholic Church to ordain women. They would have a First Amendment trump card against being forced to do that. But that, you can make the argument, is wildly different from you put yourself out there, web designer, <laughs> are you now commercialized enough that you just, you just have to go ahead and do it? I'll, I'll be, I want you to be quiet because I need to answer your question. So uh, for this case as well as a lot of cases that are happening in our country right now, I'm curious where the separation of church and state come into play. Right, and that's the, that is the, uh, so the question for those online is the role of our concepts of separation in church and state on these issues. And the reason I wanted to do the final case was there you see the intersection of this very problem, the free exercise clause and the establishment clause, with, um, with, with these laws. So it's very hard, very complicated, and um, one of my favorite areas to teach are the religion clauses, and they are going through a period of evolution. But I'll give you a few of the traditional milestones, although a lot of this is in flux. So one very interesting notion is that even when we can trace a law to religious views, even if we are confident that the reason the law got enacted was that in that realm there was a religious driver behind it, it doesn't automatically invalidate the law if there is an otherwise secular purpose to justify the law. So you don't see this much anymore, but there was a, long, a time in American society in which there were blue laws. And the idea was most commercial businesses could not operate on Sunday. And employees couldn't be forced to work on Sunday. And, you know, Sunday was a day, a day of rest. And there's no doubt that that comes from Christian traditions of the Sabbath being, being celebrated on Sunday. And that the particular case involved the state of Maryland. And everybody on earth knew that the reason Sunday was the day was the, you know, heavy Christian traditions and Catholic traditions in Maryland. The Supreme Court upheld the law and said it doesn't matter that there may be religious antecedents to a secular law, there were bona fide secular reasons for doing this, like family day, day of rest. Uh, and the fact that most people would rather do it on Sunday rather than Saturday, so you picked a Christian Sabbath, not a Jewish Sabbath, is just an accommodation of reality. Um, so that's one example. Let me give you the opposite example, <laughs> which is um, uh, one of the most famous, uh, I'll give you a couple quick examples. And I know we have to quit in, in five minutes, but um, when Utah was a federal territory, people that started in Vermont and migrated across the United States and ended up in, in Utah, people from the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, believed in polygamy. The federal government 
which ran Utah at the time, banned polygamy. The Mormons brought a case to the Supreme Court of the United States, one of the oldest religion cases from the 18th century, from the 19th century. And the Supreme Court said, um, the fact that it's your religious belief that you should be able to engage in polygamy, and the fact that we accept that the ban on polygamy probably comes from modern Judeo-Christian beliefs, doesn't matter. A law is a law, it's a secular law. You don't have a religious exemption from that law, and you can ban polygamy in Utah. I only have a few seconds left, but um, I'll tell you, try to tell you a 90 second story. That rule right now is in play very much in the Supreme Court of the United States. And whose side you're on shifts dramatically because it is kind of the, the fact that it is in play was at one point in American history a progressive notion. So there were progressive advocates who said that rule against the Mormons is, too, is wrong. It's too hard-nosed. It doesn't accommodate religious liberty. And there were several famous cases, but my favorite was a case called Wisconsin versus Yoder. And this was my favorite because when I taught at William & Mary, Chief Justice Warren Burger had retired, but he had become the Chancellor of William & Mary, which is a sort of ceremonial post. The current King Charles, Prince Charles was once a Chancellor, and Sandra O'Connor was a Chancellor. Well, Warren Bur people thought if you were the Chancellor, you came once a year to graduation, you wore all this bling, and then, you know, that was it. You went to the nice dinner. But he took it, it's like he wanted an office, he wanted you know, research assistance, and he was there all the time. So the president of the university said, well, we've got to have somebody. He's the chief, former chief justice of the United States. I was a young constitutional law professor. He says, Rod, would you be the chief's liaison when it comes to the campus? I said, yeah, sure. So he was famous for being very stiff, very stuck up, very um, pompous. Um, but how often do you have a chance to hang out with one, a former Supreme Court justice? So what I found out was he loved to go to the Williamsburg Inn, which is this five-star inn in Williamsburg, at tea time. And he loved sherry. And he liked the little finger sandwiches, and he liked the sherry. And after a few sherries, he loosened up a bit. And I ended up having these long, long talks with him, which was great. I got to pick his brain you know, every few weeks. And so one time I said, Chief Justice, what was the famous, most famous case you ever wrote? What was your favorite case of your entire time on the Supreme Court of the United States? And he said, Wisconsin versus Yoder, which is one of my favorite cases. And um, it involved the old order Amish in Wisconsin who did not want their children to go to accredited schools after the age of 13 in violation of Wisconsin truancy laws. The state of Wisconsin said, you gotta let them off the farm. You gotta either bring your schools into a compliance with our accreditation principles, send them to public school. You can't just raise them on the farm and homeschool them. That violates our truancy laws. And the Supreme Court said, this is not Thoreauian isolationism. The court talked about Walden Pond and said, this is not Henry David Thoreau wanting to be separate from society. These are religious beliefs. The Amish believe this as a matter of religious conviction. They should not be forced to send the children to these schools because the values of the schools are contrary to their religious value system. And state of Wisconsin, you violate the First Amendment when you make them do it. That's a fascinating tension between the Utah case and the Wisconsin case. It is coming to a new showdown. And I'll leave with this little editorializing. The political alignments are shifting because now the view that you should respect the religious beliefs has, is largely a view driven by the conservative right and by the more conservative Supreme Court justices, and it's being asserted in the context of gender identity and sexual orientation. The very, the very case you just heard argued is Exhibit A, because it's likely the court's gonna side with the web designer and against the state of Colorado. So it's going to be a blow to affirming transgender rights and, 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 and sexual orientation rights. So it's going, to, it's going to be a blow to civil rights laws in the name of religious freedom. And we are in a church. Maybe that's a good word to end on. So thank you all for having me. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure.
There's nothing mystical about this. This is actual water. <laughs> so do you want to tell us how you predict the two cases are going to come out? Okay, so the, the, the case involving the 11th Circuit and the 4th Circuit, right. the Supreme Court has not yet accepted review. Uh -huh. But I suspect but it, it will. It almost has to. I suspect yeah. it will. The case is so recent, and you can get a 90-day extension on your appeal time. I expect there'll be a petition filed in the court will grant it, I think. It could, it could say this is too hot to handle, we don't want to go there. Um, I think this court will side with the transgender students. With the full circuit. I do, I do. Okay. And, and this is, and, and, and counting, counting votes, I would count Chief Justice Roberts is likely to go that way, and Neil Gorsuch is likely to go that way. And we, I, I, so you never know, but I, I really do think so. Um, Colorado? Yeah, okay. Six to three in favor of the um, of Lori Smith. Really? That yeah, that is to say against the civil rights act. That's my prediction. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You mean it? Okay. <laughs> Do you think they will um, they will sort of identify this sort of religious expression? Yeah. Yeah, and and technically. It, the, the, the lower courts litigated it as a religion case and as a speech case, but the Supreme Court only took it as a speech case, uh, which is a little curious, but I think the reason, the reason the court only took it as a speech case is because the religion jurisprudence of the court is now in chaos, it's in disarray, involving this very showdown that I just talked to you about. So I think the court wants to set that aside and simply say something as simple as, you can't make people say something that they don't want to say, but there probably will have to be some qualifier along the lines of it being a political or an ideological or a cultural statement. It's something that separates it from run of the mill, you know, do you want cheese on your, on your hamburger? I mean, that, that, that can't be. Gus, go ahead. Do you think the court wants to put itself in the position over time of deciding those issues about uh, you know, it's kind of elitist to say that somebody who does a website is uh, is privileged, and, and somebody who arranges the the, the, the setting and at the wedding with the furniture and the flowers or whatever is is. Not well, the, I I hear that. So the question for the, anybody still listening online is, would the court want to go down the line of seeming to draw distinctions between the intellectual enterprise involving the web design and the more mundane exercise of setting up the tables or something like that. And I think the answer, Gus, is I don't think that would be a problem because it's simply another way of restating the problem. When is something expressive? When, is it, when does it count as speech under the First Amendment? And when is it not? So I'm wearing a bow tie. I'm expressing myself in a sense. But a run-of-the-mill fashion is typically not speech. But if I say, vote for Biden on my, on my t-shirt, that's clearly expression. So these can be hard cases. But there is a body of law that says we can figure out when something's expressive or not. And I think the court would probably resort to that. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all for coming.